Strangers to London might notice a bit of pedway. They might say, what's that walkway up there? Or why is there a bridge between those buildings or across that road? And they don't seem to go anywhere. You can't get to them. I think it's a, a nice thing to be able to tell them that was once a grand plan to connect the whole city up so that people could walk above the traffic in the air, right around the whole city. And if only you could get up there, and if only if you could walk around, you would see the city through very different eyes than the ones you do from the street. You see it from a bird's eye, really. And that would be special if you could get right round. But you'd have to tell that visitor, I'm afraid nearly every one of those is closed. And those that do exist, I'm afraid, on the whole, will take you precisely nowhere. The Pedway is the word that the City of London used for their version of what is actually a very common motif in 1960s urban design, which is a system of elevated pedestrian walkways. It's an abstract planning concept thought up in the days when planners were all architects, where it was felt not only that form followed function, but that people would follow architecture. The Pedway was a utopian dream. It was a dream about providing a perfect walking environment for walkers through a very busy city. And as a dream, it was a fabulous idea. The idea of vistas, comfort, getting easily from one place to the other, the din of everyday life below you. There is something deeply romantic about looking at a city which has bridges that go through the air. We've seen these in fairy tale illustrations. We know this idea from ancient tales, like uh, the fabled city of Babylon and its hanging gardens had pedestrian walkways up in those hanging gardens thousands of years ago. On big bits of 1950s paper on drawing boards, it all made sense. But the reality was so prosaic in that any urban poetry that was always going to be unpopular. There's just that gap between you know, what was on the drawing board and what was built. OK, to understand the Pedways, you have to start from the Blitz. Destruction of a lot of the city, great swathes of it, particularly north of St Paul's, and above all, the huge 44-acre expanse of devastation north of London Wall. Barbican site. It's pretty hard to imagine today what the area around the Barbican was like, even 15 years after the Second World War. The Germans had really bombed that area heavily, and in fact, about a third of the whole of the city of London was basically missing in 1945. That was the extent of the bombing. It was enormous. The Barbican area was simply like a kind of ground zero, really, of its time. Over the years, nothing much happened over the first decade. It was like a bomb site. Willow Herb grew out of it, there were wrecked bicycles, there were rubbish blowing across it, a tumbleweed sort of landscape. The planners were thinking what to do, but it took a long time before they really made a decision. When the war ended and the city was left in ruins, planning didn't exist. Time and country planning was introduced in 1947. The people that had the first say immediately following the cessation of bombing were engineers. And therefore it's not surprising that one of the first things they wanted to do was to put in dual carriageway roads right through the centre of the city. And this of course is uh, where the idea for the Pedway in the city came about at the same time. Um, as an engineering stroke architectural concept of if we're going to build these dual carriageways the last thing we want is people crossing the road every few yards. Let's get them up on decks up above. The view then was that traffic would expand to a certain point. Nobody realised quite how busy a city like London would become with traffic, nor did they really understand quite the number of traffic movements from all forms of traffic, what there'd be. If you look back, for instance, at reports made by London Transport in the 1950s, they underestimated, too, the need they had for provision of transport. Today, the number of people moving, the number of movements made through a city is just extraordinary. It would seem astronomical to a 1950s planner like Buchanan. Colin Buchanan was a civil servant. He had been very much involved in the study of road accidents before the Second World War, when the road accident rate, the fatality rate from road accidents was 
appallingly high. It was complete carnage on the roads. We tend to forget that. His whole approach was shaped by the dangers of motorisation and the hazards and the need to separate pedestrians into a safer realm where they wouldn't be disturbed by the noise, the fumes and the sheer physical danger of traffic. There was a very sort of conservative minimalist plan, the 40 plan, which was for rebuilding the streets. Then there was the 1947 plan by William Holford, former Bartlett professor, and Sir Charles Holden, architect of London Underground Stations and of 55 Broadway. They were trying to bring the best of the past, really, with the future. So they wanted to create, on paper, of course, a city in which the buildings would be very, very grand and special, and so much so that they wanted to break up the existing streetscape so rather than traditional streets, which you only see the front of the buildings really, you'd see the buildings all the way around. It's a very radical view of what a city might look like. Now to make that work for the pedestrian, they thought, well, we'll have pedestrians really in safe zones, or what the Americans call precincts, that um, Holden, who was much influenced by New York, would call them precincts too, and pedestrians would walk around safely down there. Traffic, meanwhile, where would it go? Oh, the main idea was to go around this great dual carriageway elevated around the city of London, like a great sort of skeletric set going around the city. So that's the origin of the dual carriageways that we've got London Wall on the one hand and Lower Thames Street on the other. And then the other side of it was this uh, remarkably persuasive vision of the city as a wonderful place for pedestrians. And that was a very good part of their plan. They, have a wonderful chapter on the alleyways, the streets, the back streets, the intimacy, the face-to-face, -face, the hustle, the bustle of the city as a pedestrian environment. But in that 1947 plan, it was all at ground level. One of the great inspirations for young architects from the First World War onwards, thinking about a bedway system, was Venice because Venice had been doing this very successfully for hundreds and hundreds of years. There, as we all know, you have a network of bridges and walkways that take you over canals. You never have to get your feet wet, and you move very effectively and very quickly and unexpectedly through the city because you don't have to follow the conventional routes. The Bauhaus was very keen on promoting the idea of the segregation of pedestrians from traffic. Ludwig Hilberstein from the Bauhaus wrote a book about this in 1927, and he was really set a trend which fellow architects grabbed on. This idea of the city of the future would be on these many, many levels. Traffic on one level, pedestrians on the other, tall skyscrapers shooting up between them. The old street would disappear entirely. And this is truly radical, revolutionary stuff. Le Capuzier developed his ideas for the pedestrian city, if you like, independently of the Bauhaus. Obviously, having listening to what's going on, but he developed his own ideas, and he came up with one idea that was just, it was almost gloriously mad. I mean, it could never have happened, but he planned basically to demolish half of Paris in his mind. He drew it beautifully, and this new world, this Ville Radieuse, this glorious new city, would be devoted really to people who would live this classless life in these super modern apartments, and the cars would just whiz by on elevated expressways and that was quite different from the German view which was that the cars should be down below and the pedestrians above. Capuzier liked the idea of the traffic whizzing along on these super motorways. Most of the public would have seen very little of the actual architect's work. That was very much for consumption amongst fellow architects, by urban planners, perhaps by city councils, by academics, but certainly not for the general public. What the general public got to see really were illustrations in early science fiction comics, or they saw things in early films. I mean, Fritz Lang's Metropolis is a perfect example of this futuristic city with people separated on different levels. It's rather wonderful thing to look at. There's another film, Things to Come is the name of the film. Um, again, you see pedestrians, traffic segregated, and you even see aeroplanes flying down streets between enormous buildings. So the public had very much a sort of, yeah, a comic film version of what was really going on. Where did the support come from? Well, the Court of Common Council, the City Corporation, took, uh, I think, a courageous decision to support this vision. And in the case of the Barbican, I think everybody would say that that was entirely the right thing to do. City architect Anthony Beeland 
was the prime mover, so it was the architect and the planning side of the city which basically took the walkway, the elevated circulation system for pedestrians as the basic requirement for future office blocks in the city. It needed space, you needed to have large cleared sites and you could get those two ways. Bombing was one, post-war reconstruction did create large voids in the city. The alternative was to use public powers of compulsory purchase to knock down perfectly sound structures which had survived the bombing. In other words, a comprehensive redevelopment model. What we saw in the city was a combination of the two. Uh, you had the legacy of the Blitz. But the legacy of the Blitz always left some buildings getting in the way of what the architects might have wanted to do with their visionary scheme. We first had a taste of vertical segregation in the fantastic Festival of Britain. The Festival of Britain was exactly what it sounds like. It was a festival to celebrate Britain's emergence out of the Second World War. And the idea was going to be on the South Bank in London, on a big, a largely disused or semi-industrial site. And it was going to be a thing of joy. It was going to be sunshine among the dark clouds of life at the time. And remember, this is a ration book Britain. And it's a Britain one imagines always in black and white film. But the festival was deeply colourful and deliberately so. The idea was to say, here's a new world, but it's a new world for every man. And it's this idea of this classless society. Everyone was going to be brought up to a certain standard of life. And actually, what was interesting, it put the pedestrian first. And so physically, the place was a serious of these pedestrian decks covered in most wonderful, glorious, modern, futuristic pavilions. And that was the real trigger for applying the idea to London Wall and the city. The City of London planners, politicians and even architects were fundamentally conservative and although they had this plan by Holden and Holford that was quite radical, they really still wanted streets to exist as they were and they wanted buildings to be fairly traditional in character. But they had to listen to the architects of the London County Council, which was the overall planning body for London. And even the City of London, although it's quite a strange anomaly in London politics, had to listen. And there were these young utopian architects who were, they were zealots, really. I mean, they were sort of, um, they didn't look like it. They'd have worn you know, lots of tweed and very nice suits and bow ties, but they were radicals. Leslie Martin, Walter Bohr, the whole team of them, and they felt that the city should do something more ambitious and worked with the city architect, Anthony Leland, to up their game and produce a more radical vision of a modern reconstructed city in which the principle applied would be that of the podium and the tower. So it was in 1955 that the city decided to build the dual carriageway, which is still there, and to line the dual carriageway with a raised podium, a raised pedestrian deck, from which would rise a sequence of towers which would be set at right angles to the road. And their idea was that the new architecture would be very much sort of a Bauhaus meets the latest in New York, so steel and glass towers. The key building in New York that had affected them all was a building called the Lever Building, designed in the early 50s by the architects SOM. It's still there, it's fully restored today and it's very elegant. It's a sheer steel and glass box with a podium level. You walk up to it in the podium and it gives you a little glimpse of the future. And it's totally, of course, disconnected from the rest of New York. It just sits there like a little architectural island today, but everybody loves it. The Concrete Boys, it was quite different. They were hugely influenced by Cabusier himself, who was the master of this idea of what he called beton bruise, of raw concrete. But the raw concrete, when poured and worked on by craftsmen, in the case of the Barbican, a whole load of Italian craftsmen brought in stonemasons to make the concrete look as it does, to look as raw as it does. So the very raw look is actually sculpted and crafted. Um, and they built a sort of citadel, a fortress in concrete. But there really was genuinely an aesthetic rivalry between these two camps. And the interesting thing in the city of London, you see both together, two groups of future-looking people, both building what they wanted to do.
and indeed they managed to do it just once. London Wall, when it was new in the late 50s, early 60s, was the most remarkably unexpected thing in London. It looked like a bit of, sort of Soviet Russia. London Wall, which runs below me here, now called Route 11, the office accommodation is going up. One building is finished and the others will soon be completed. Now the pedestrians will have their own level on a continuous deck where I am standing now. All the office entrances and the shops will be at this level too. And in this way the relatively slow moving pedestrian will be taken well away from the hazards of intermingling and mixing with the fast-moving vehicles. The city, the square mile, right up until the 1970s, even the 1980s, was a centre for the handling of material commodities. It was a great market centre for stuff. You know, the Pool of London was a working dock. The warehouses were full of trades and uh, furs and spices. And, this process of change from a centre of material commerce to an office district was already apparent and starting in the post-war period. The city fathers realised the danger that they would simply become, in American parlance, a CBD. And they didn't want simply to become a CBD, they'd always been so much more. Part of their solution was to bring back a resident population and the Barbican was a deliberate, conscious attempt to bring in people who would not only work in the city, but could live in the city and could live a full life. So the Barbican was always meant to be a complete city within the city. Never had much in the way of shops, mark you, but uh, the cultural centre did bring in that richness of activity, the sort of sense of a 24-hour place rather than simply a flatted estate in the middle of a CBD. It's an interesting question how the general public responded to this experiment. It was an experiment that was going on all over the place. I think it was accepted that the new city would be radically different and we were sort of in the process of building it. And the process took a long time. Of course it took a very long time. Uh, the Barbican construction was slow and laborious and the early days of the Arts Centre were <laughs> dogged by the tremendous difficulty people had in finding their way around the walkways. How do you get to the buildings? If you're a pedestrian coming out of a tube station, it's quite confusing. If you're told you had to go to a meeting at a particular office in London Wall, and most people constantly had to ask, how do I get there? You saw this all the time. Because they didn't quite realise you have to go up staircases to get to a deck, as they were called, to get access to the lobby of a building, rather than the lobby being on the pavement. And so these things threw people. So it wasn't so much the architecture that was sort of wrong-headed, it was the planning. There were lots of different schemes to paint the coloured lines on the floor and I think there were three different redesigns of the signage system to try and help people find their way from wherever it is they'd sort of climbed up onto the deck to the point where they had to des descend down to the Barbican Auditorium. It was, it is complex, but gradually we've all got used to it and what we realise now is that this isn't part of a, a larger whole, it's an enclave, it's an island of vertical movement in a sea of normal street-based pedestrianism. The idea that people would react with excitement to the creation of new cities, I, I, I think that was much more in the minds of architects and planners than ever with the general public. Although I can remember in the mid-60s, the post-war Paternoster Square being used for the opening credits of a soap opera called The Power Game the managing director and his Dolly Bird secretary in her miniskirt and little pillbox hat walked across the piazza. This was the heights of modernity and this was the modern city. Pasternoster Square had one 
key problem with it. This was um, an elevated system of walkways with buildings between them, sort of uh, really slabby buildings. I mean, almost without style, almost willfully without style. And this was functionalism taken to an extreme in London. It wasn't quite Bauhaus, but it was because uh, it didn't have the artistry. It just had the functionalism. And this was a way of surrounding St Paul's with what was meant to be, this is really strange, um, in the planner's head, they thought they were being slightly picturesque in not having serried streets and avenues, even in St Paul's, but this more higgledy-piggledy effect of tower blocks that were higher and lower and pedestrians climbed up and down around them. But the result was something that was so barren and plain and grim. Did modern planners and architects in London ever use their eyes? Those planners swept away the lanes and alleys hidden away squares and courtyards, which in most other European countries would have been lovingly rebuilt after the war. You have, ladies and gentlemen, to give this much to the Luftwaffe. When it knocked down our buildings, it didn't replace them with anything more offensive than rubble. We did that. There was a huge row about what to do, but the row ended up oh, with the creation of a kind of very compromised new Pastor Square, which is a sort of mishmash of buildings, some quite good, some not very good, some in the kind of arts and crafts style brought up to date, some in the kind of neoclassical style brought up to date. On the whole, it's a bit of a sort of wibbly wobbly stage set stuff, a bit of, you know, quality street chocolate box design. But there's no question that the new Pastor Square is hugely more successful than the whole for one of the 50s. Uh, I think it took rather a while for the uh, shortcomings to kick in and people to realise that uh, uh, you're often better off taking existing societies and adapting them and refurbishing them than starting from scratch on a clean sheet of paper. I think the average person is more likely to notice bad planning than good planning. Uh, it's always been a problematic concept. Because obviously if, if a person can achieve the things they wish to achieve at ground level, they're not going to climb a flight of stairs to do it they realised that there was a lot more work to be done to make this system function as a city should. And so it was rather belatedly that the city corporation tried to develop other uses, other activities, pubs, shops, putting kiosks on the podium, and trying to encourage retailers and pub landlords to move up from the safety of the pavements where they'd been for hundreds and hundreds of years up to this strange and largely deserted environment of the deck. And they had to offer incentives. And there were some partial successes. I mean, you could have a pint on the Barbican deck, but basically this bit of the ideal never really worked. It was never credible. There was certainly a degree of illusion and delusion in the way that the uh, pedways were presented to the public, certainly on those public information films or Pathé News or films made by banks or by the Corporation of London, by the LCC. Because what they would have done, you know, they would have just gathered people. If you look at the people in the film, they're often people that worked in the Central Office of Information or for the Corporation of London, sitting down and they'll put up a martini umbrella for them to sit under and drink you know, a little drink, and it all looked rather jolly in that nice lurid Kodak colour film at the time. But the reality was certainly never like that, absolutely not. That image, by the way, that you see in the films had come out of what was already a fairly long tradition of this idea of townscape, this sort of idea that you could create an art, like a sort of friendly art form out of town planning, and that had come actually not out of an academic school, by the way, not out of the Bauhaus, not from the Cabusier. It had come from a magazine, which was the Architecture Review magazine, which throughout the Second World War was thinking about the future. And they really liked the idea, could you create cities of the future that were picturesque and romantic and modern? And that was what they called townscape when you applied it to a city. And that's where those images came from. All those early drawings in the magazine always had these um, equivalent of martini umbrellas and people sitting looking glamorous and happy in these places. But as soon as the cameras moved away, when those films were made and the rain came down and the clouds came, people would scuttle back down to the old streets. The trouble the way that the new streets were cut out, the new buildings positioned, is that they created lots of wind tunnels. And the best place to be is walking down on the street through the old, let's say through the old alleys, 
which give you lovely protection from the wind, protection from the traffic, and you can zip through, if you know them, very quickly from one part of the city to the other. And the whole point of the city, in a way, socially, was that anyone could get anywhere within 10 minutes of walking. You know, that was the joy of it. So they were unpopular from the start. The human beings are like water. They will always flow to the point of least resistance. All the time as we navigate urban space, we're calculating what is our optimal path. And that line, that desire line, as we call it, very, very rarely involved climbing upstairs onto a pretty inhospitable concrete deck and then climbing down at the far end. There was a, um, an escalator installed at Alden Gate, but historically the original deck, I think the only one that's got the original tiling, I mean, looking very 60s, is the escalator at the back of Moorgate Station. But otherwise, you had to walk up the stairs onto the deck, and human beings, in general, won't choose a deviation if there's a more direct line. It's not laziness, it's efficiency. I think from the outset, people would follow the road and stay at ground level if they possibly could. It's very interesting, even in sections of London Wall where footways had deliberately been left out, to ensure that people did use the upper walkways, people would then walk in the road or walk across the paving that had been designed to make it almost impossible to walk on. So uh, people were very resourceful at staying at ground level. The original conception was that you would pretty much move everything up to the deck level. But no, I mean it was ambiguous and it still is ambiguous and the practicalities, the hard sort of engineering problems, the maintenance problems, the management problems, were picked up afterwards, and many of them proved really quite difficult. I mean, the, you know, how do you light the walkways? How do you maintain them? What's their legal status? Drains tended to get blocked, puddles would form, and so that, you know, there was uh, this constant battle to, uh, to, to keep them water-free and to keep them clean. And remember, again, the whole point of an elevated path, the whole point of the Ridgeway thousands of years ago, was to make sure you didn't have to squelch through water, it was to provide a, a drier platform on which to walk. The funny thing about the Pedway system is that it was never really conceived as a system. They didn't have a drawing of the network as a whole. The drawing had to be reconstructed from the planning consents for individual office blocks. What happens is that as offices were built, the developers would be required under the private legislation, which was passed by the City of London in 1967, would be required to install a walkway. But there was no clear map of how these bits related to each other. And of course the difficulty was that the, it was extremely expensive to put in the bridges which would connect them together. The developer would be required to put in the abutment to carry the weight of the bridge, but the plotting of the pieces was a rather belated process. If you look at the plans for the 1980s, what you have is a series of attempts to map the system and to try and figure out what could be stitched together into a viable system, a circulation system, by the addition of bridges. So what you have is a load of fragments and the distant prospect of joining them all up. And very sensibly, developers were allowed to make interim use. So sometimes you see that the space was used for offices on an interim basis. You see the sort of arcading of the walkway has been glazed in. It's still recognisably a space which could at some future stage be used as a walkway and some of the abutments where the bridges were going to go were similarly bricked up. So you see even today buildings with just uh, with strange concealed balconies or half-hidden balconies. You think, what's going on there? Isn't that an office behind there? Why, why isn't there glass there? Because behind there is just a dead bit of pedway that was never connected up. There was even a, a point where the path goes up to an edge as a precipice with a metal rail across. 
it was always going to be fragmented. I think one can say that without being clever, without using hindsight, because the way that the City of London has always developed, even after the Great Fire of 1666, Christopher Wren came up with a grand plan to rebuild it in modern terms in the late 17th century. It never happened, and nor did the new planning really ever happen in a comprehensive way after the Blitz and after the Second World War. And the reason is because it will not stop to complete a grand plan, and the Pedway was a grand plan that was never completed. When a walkway works, it's extremely satisfying that you don't have to worry about looking left and right and worrying about crossing the road. You don't feel you're in conflict with anybody. You just have yourself to look after. The Pedway fails miserably as, as soon as it becomes patchy and comes to an end. So it was only ever going to work as a network and probably it would only have ever worked if it had been done at one point. You can trace the abandonment of the walkways through the 1980s. It was the time of Thatcherism, so you had the conflicting pressures on the one hand of Big Bang and increasingly of the competition from London Docklands, and on the other hand, a rising conservation movement. It has started to emerge in the 1930s as Georgian buildings were being demolished willy-nilly. Second World War, of course, suddenly loads of London vanished. Once that happened, really our heritage became precious. Working with politicians, the clever thing conservationists did was to get listing orders made on individual buildings, but get them listed in a patchwork so that you couldn't put a pedway through or connect a pedway up because the list of buildings were in the way. So that pedway system in the end was not stopped wholly by the fact it was unpopular with the public, which it was. It was stopped to a great degree by the conservation lobby. If you look at all the discussion in the 1980s, it's about what should be consolidated. The word that they used was the minimum pedway network. So there were certain areas around London Wall, possibly around Cannon Street, but elsewhere, the new fast track construction buildings, the Big Bang architecture, none of this had walkways. Architecture was moving in the direction of the street. Urbanism became a new study and it meant not urban planning in this sort of ruthless, geometric, scientific Bauhaus way, but it meant restoring the culture of the city and giving streets back to people that they would enjoy. And the logical extreme of that has been what we can see in Exhibition Road in South Kensington, London, where the street is truly given back, not just the pedestrians, but for pedestrians to share with traffic if you take away all of the markings and the roundabouts and the footbridges and simply create a paved space where pedestrians and cyclists and vehicles are left to get on with it, car drivers will drive more slowly and more carefully because they'll be less sure of their right of way. Pedestrians will probably look a bit more carefully before they stray from their path and maybe cyclists even will become a little more adept at threading the way through the lot without colliding with anything. All of that seems to work, and although it appears counterintuitive to the traffic engineer, taking these things away seems to make places safer rather than more dangerous. So the barriers are coming out. This type of thinking was spearheaded, I suppose it could be the word, by the Dutch, the famous Hans Mondeman with his concept of shared spaces. And actually, the IRA helped us because the Ring of Steel the security perimeter, which made the whole of the square mile a sort of precinct, that favoured pedestrianism. So there's been a lot of radical rethinking, and of course in that rethinking, the original notion of pushing the pedestrians up to decks really had no part at all. Pedways are not a complete disaster. There are parts of the world where they've worked particularly well, and the examples that spring to my mind are Hong Kong on the one hand, where a very hot and humid climate means that it's much more comfortable to walk from one shopping centre or building to another through an air-conditioned tube above the traffic flows of Hong Kong. Another example, I suppose, would be in Canadian cities like Montreal and Toronto, where the winter temperatures of minus 30 or lower make it very unpleasant to go outside and use the streets. 
and the underground connections that exist between their shopping centres and buildings uh, again are strongly used and people spend most of their day in the city either in buildings or going between them underground. There's a very good example now in New York, the High Line Walkway that runs up the west side of Manhattan now, growing year by year, following an old railway line. It's a wonderful example of the way you can get up and walk above the city. The London ones, the city of London pathways, were always bleak. Nobody thought of covering them in plants or making them very decorative in any way. They were always very brutal to look at and the experience was brutal. The only time it works is in the Barbican where that brutality becomes an artwork because it's so well done. The best walkway in London since the Second World War has been the opening up of the South Bank all the way along from Southwark right the way through. It keeps going and going and going. Now that is so popular now on a Sunday it's actually much annoying. You can hardly get through it. You know, that used to be deserted, lots of that empty. But where is it? It's on the ground level really. The pedways are fascinating things, you know, what survives of them, because they're like, they're like a sort of 1950s, 60s archaeology, and I think that's what fascinates people. They're things to clamber up and climb over, and to see bits of London from a perspective you don't normally have. It's a very, very odd environment up there. It's a curiosity to see such deserted spaces in the heart of such a bustling commercial district. We should encourage people to go and see it while it's still there. All types of architectural and urban experiments leave physical sediments in the urban environment and that's what's, what makes cities such fun. It's very easy for a planner of one generation to look back at the work of planners of previous generations and wonder why on earth they did it. There are often expediencies and needs of a time that lead to a certain planning requirement. When those needs change or disappear, the planning doesn't appear to make sense. They might have been right at that time, but they aren't right for this age. They were much more sort of pessimistic about the need to accommodate traffic. The pedestrian was the figure from the past. They were the, the disposable element. It was the motorist who was king, king of the road. So there was a lot of Mr. Toad mentality. The driver, presumed to be male, a male commuter from the suburbs, would in future be driving in to his job in the city. Now, actually, 50 years on, it's not like that. So we don't need the motorway grade capacity, which both Holford and Holden and Buchanan assumed to be necessary I think this fantastic thing has happened in the last 30 years is the tremendous revival of public transport, cycling and pedestrianism. The past is often a more beautiful, more delightful land than the present. I mean, that's a common human view. But with the pedways, I think what the attraction is, is not quite that. It's a, it's a strange sort of nostalgia. It's a nostalgia for a world that was going to be futuristic, that was very nearly there and didn't quite happen. But there's something today, I think, haunting and mysterious about these walkways that go nowhere. And I think those of us that love the City of London and, you know, just love walking around it, still dream somehow of walking up and through all those buildings and somehow getting right round the city, uh, not quite like a bird, but almost like a sort of an angel wandering around your city above the pavement. For consciously or not, everyone is part architect of his own community. In this series, we've tried to show you the growth of your own towns. For what has happened to York, Edinburgh, Oldham and London has happened to some degree to every town, for better and worse. We've done this in the hope that you can use this knowledge to see that the mistakes of the past are not repeated and to see that ideals are given a fair hearing and that idealism does not succumb to expediency. Goodbye.